Who is responsible for teaching and preaching? My pastor. Who will share the gospel with our community? That's my pastor. And who will visit the sick and the hurting? My pastor, right? And who will teach our small groups? And who will rock the babies in the nursery? And who will bring dinner to your sick neighbor or be a witness at your job? My pastor? In the first century church, the 12 apostles were out preaching and teaching. They knew they were called to that. But as new churches popped up, there were new questions. What about the other responsibilities of the church? The first century church knew the success of their ministry involved the members of the body understanding what they were capable of. It would take all of them. So they responded and they grew. Using the talents, gifts, and resources entrusted to each of them. We are better together. The pastor. The young married couple. The rich man. The poor man. The church. Asking ourselves, where is there a need? And how will we respond? Our ministry efforts are multiplied when we discover and accept our true calling. It's not for us to do all on our own. We are part of a family with many talents. Plain and simple in all things. The church is better together. We are better together, but before we go any further, you're thinking, that doesn't look like Aaron Bryant. According to your bulletin, he's supposed to be up there. Well, I, I guess I would look like Aaron if he had a really bad, bad day, okay? But he hasn't had a bad day. The reason he is not here is because baby girl Bryant chose to be born early this morning. And so she joins <laughs> Silas and Isaiah and a proud mama and a proud papa, and we rejoice with that family. And, uh, you know, when you hear about news of, uh, of people having babies, it takes you back to if you are married and have children, how that happened for you. And our daughter was born two months early at Christmas time. And so Elizabeth was born. It was this beautiful moment. And then I heard singing out in the hallway, and, and the music kind of sounded familiar. And I, I went outside, and there was our choir singing in the halls of Baptist Hospital during Christmas. I went back in to tell Beth, and all she could say was, if you bring those people in here. <laughs> so I'm all about serving, but you know, there are limits and boundaries and all that kind of stuff. So that was a good lesson, and I'm still learning those lessons, and she is still having to teach me, but we do know the power of receiving pastoral care. I had never been on the receiving end of pastoral care before. I mean, I'm a minister, my dad was a minister. We were always giving to others and there's beauty and wonder in that. But if you have ever been on the receiving end of care, man, you know how powerful that is. And if you have been, why would you not want to also be on the giving end of care as well. And that's part of being better together. So I want you to stand as we read today's scripture passage from the book of Acts. It's a beautiful story of how the church 2,000 years ago cared for one another. And we're going to talk and we're going to see how it applies to us. The 21st century is so related to what happens here in the first century. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. 
The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. May God bless the reading of his word. Pray with me. Father, the church was your idea. We are your bride. You serve us, and you tell us to serve others as an act of worship and service to you. So show us how to do that, and thank you for those who minister so faithfully so that this place is a place of healing and care for a world so desperately looking for it. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so here's the situation. If you know the book of Acts very well, you know that the Christian movement started among Jews first and then moves on to embrace the entire Gentile world. But this embracing of the entire Gentile world has not happened yet in Acts chapter 6. This group of believers who have not even been called Christians yet, these Jewish people who accept Jesus as the Messiah... They are the church. And so they're trying to figure out how to make this thing work. There were no manuals. This was brand new. This is first generation. This is very fresh. They're trying to figure it out. The word of God is growing. If you read the two verses at the end of chapter 5, right before these verses, you will see that they're being persecuted, and yet numbers are being added daily. I mean, talk about a management challenge. How do we respond and endure what the outside is doing to us? And how do we incorporate all of these needy people that are coming to us? They were buffeted on all sides. But I hope that you saw in this story what appears to be the incredible calm, the incredible unity, the incredible purpose by which they faced this challenge. They were being obedient, but they still had challenges. And if you look at verse 1, you see here was a problem. The Grecian Jews, widows, were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. You see, this early church, before it goes to the Gentiles, they were all Jews, but there was still diversity. There was the Hebraic Jews who would have lived and grown up in Israel They spoke Aramaic, and there were the Grecian Jews who might have been subsequent converts who grew up elsewhere, and they moved or they migrated to Jerusalem. How do these two groups get together? Don't you find that amazing in the church that for all of our differences that we can still stand one another and hang out together and love each other? They were trying to figure this out. I do not think that the overlooking of the widow, the Grecian Jewish widow's needs was malicious. They were just overwhelmed and they were trying to take care of everything and and the Grecian Jews probably didn't speak Aramaic and so things just fell through the cracks. Sound like your life? Sometimes things just fall through the cracks. But if you look at verse 2, they are determined to do the right thing. And it looks to me as if they did. The 12, the only time that the 12 apostles are referred to as the 12 in the book of Acts, they gather the congregation together, and together they figure out what to do. Do you notice that the 12 do not pick the seven? The 12 tell the congregation, pick seven. Now, when you read verses 2 and 3, you might think that, are the 12 being a little sarcastic? Hey, we don't have time to wait tables. No, that's not the attitude at all. They knew how important taking care of the needy among them was. The apostles are the ones who were the eyewitnesses to the events of the life of Jesus. The Bible had not been written. These were brand new believers. The 12 had to focus on the teaching of the word, the ministry of the word, because there was really no one else to do that. And so they called the congregation together, 
Find seven among you, they say. Why seven? That was common in Jewish courts of that day to have seven members. So that would have made sense to the people. And the people go and they pray and they find these seven that are listed here. And what is significant about these seven, the first two that are mentioned, we see again. The last five we don't see again after this reference, but Stephen was selected. He met the qualifications of being full of wisdom and full of the spirit and having a reputation as such. So Stephen is selected. That is significant because further on in chapter 6, we see that Stephen becomes the first martyr. And then Philip is mentioned. Philip is the man who encounters the Ethiopian eunuch in subsequent chapters, which was a key event in the gospel going past just a Jewish audience to a Gentile audience as well. So we see this incredible picture of the church figuring out together, leadership and congregation, working in harmony to make sure that needs are met. Folks, if you are a believer, you know that the church is not full of perfect people and that there are going to be great needs. Let me ask you, do you see people with needs as, as problems, as inconveniences, as something to get sorted out as quickly as possible so we can get on to the next thing? Or do you see the very needs that God brings to us in a sense as gifts from God, an opportunity for us to show God that we love him as we love others? Needs are not problems. Needs are opportunities to show God how we love him, how we love our brother, and in so doing to show the world who is watching that what we say we believe, we actually live, and there, there is power in the resurrection. Because if you will look at the last verse of chapter 5 and verse 7 of what we just read, what bookends this story of taking care of each other is that the gospel grows, chapter 5, verses 42 and 43, and verse 7, that the word of God spreads. So we take care of each other for many reasons. One, we're commanded to do so. One, we are made in the image of God. One, we are called to help our brother and our sister but it's so the gospel and his church will grow. And they did it. So, let me ask you this. If you were in that Jerusalem church, would you qualify to be one of the seven? Would your reputation be such that they would say, ah, oh, yeah, she could do that. He could do that. And then if you were approached, would you accept the responsibility? Because one of the great challenges of the North American church is we want the benefits. But we are loath to embrace the responsibilities. But what blessings we miss out on. Do you realize that when you were saved, you were also gifted? And you were given a role in the church to perform. You were given a duty. And that word duty can turn your stomach or it can excite you when you consider the source of the assignment. And let me challenge you. If you have never been on the receiving end of care, just wait. Your time is coming. If you have been on the receiving end of care, just wait. Your time is coming again. And why would you deprive someone experiencing God working through you because you can't find the time or the margin or the energy or the desire to cooperate with God and his redemption plan for the world? So I want to invite you, the congregation of Brentwood Baptist Church, to see you as the seven in Acts chapter 6. We have got some incredible people in our congregation who do incredible things for us and for our children. And I'm going to call some of these people up, and I want them to stand right here, and I want them to represent to you the people in this church who love the Lord, who love each other, and who love you. 
I don't know if you're involved in a life group. You know, this church is big, but it does not feel nearly as overwhelming and impersonal when you are sharing life with a group of people. And there are hundreds of leaders who facilitate these small groups to bring that personal touch. Jamie Hoppy is one of those. I want Jamie to come up here and to stand right here where it says small group. I want Leslie Pippin to come forward. Have any of you ever received a note or a food basket from the nurture team? An incredible group of women who reach out to not only our own members, but people in need in our community. Leslie represents them. Stan Davey. Stan is one of 250 plus deacons. Brentwood Baptist has an incredible reputation in our community as being people who go to hospitals and who visit and who pray and who care, and these deacons do that and so many other things throughout the week, both seen and unseen. Larry Teague. You might be surprised that Larry represents preschool. Yes, real men work in preschool. In fact, real men need to work in preschool. You know, these are often unsung heroes. When's the last time a nine-month-old said, thank you for changing my diaper and taking care of me? But the incredible work that they do so that others can experience the fullness of God. And Steve Stark. Steve, who represents the men and women in our church who teach the Bible, who take the time and the energy on their own time, on their own dime, all of them, to make sure that we look somewhat like Acts chapter six. Now, they're standing. Now for you, if you have ever been on the receiving end of care at Brentwood Baptist Church, whether it's small groups or deacons or nurture team, preschool, Bible teaching. Maybe you have been ministered to by our incredible choir and orchestra. If you have ever been on the receiving end of care, would you please stand? Stand right now that in fact we are better together and as we serve and as we receive and as we serve and as we receive, the world sees Jesus, and the gospel is spread. And so we say thank you to these. And I say thank you to you for receiving. And I challenge you. What are you doing to reaffirm your call and your place do you recognize that you've been gifted? What kind of church would we be to tell you to serve but then not give you the tools to do so? If you are really interested, we will walk through this with you. We will show you. We will give you opportunities. We will give you training through place and, and connection Sunday that happens tonight, the journey on at home summit that happens on Saturday. We are here to engage you in ministry. Now, all of the congregation, will you please stand? And we're going to thank God for not only these five dear brothers and sisters who are behind me, but all of the other workers and leaders that they represent, all of the other ministries that are in our church, because you see, like Acts chapter 6, we are better together. The world is watching. The world is desperate. And as we are faithful to take care of each other, God adds new people to us. It's a beautiful thing. What is the reward for a job well done? More work. And so we labor in joy because of what God has done for us in Christ.